Welcome to our Issues Forum, sponsored by the Progressive Democrats of LaPorte County. I want to thank uh, the steering committee uh, who work so hard for the Progressive Democrats of LaPorte County. And I want to thank Sarah Hefner in particular for arranging for this uh, particular wonderful speaker that we're about to hear from. Um, everybody's in. Okay, so tonight um, we're very fortunate to have with us Professor Richard Rupp, who is an associate professor professor of political science at Purdue University Northwest. He currently serves as interim chair of political science, economics, and world languages. In addition, Rupp is the executive director for the Northwest Indiana World Trade Alliance. Uh, professor Rupp holds a PhD in political science from the University of California at Santa Barbara and joined the political science department at PNW in 1998. Rupp's research and teaching interests center on American foreign policy and armed conflict. He's written numerous scholarly articles on the post-Cold War military interventions and is the author of NATO after 9-11, An Alliance in Continuing Decline, published in 2007. Professor Rupp is deeply engaged in PNW's international programs and study abroad courses. He oversees PNW's academic affiliations in Oman and participates in foreign student recruitment. Uh, Professor Rupp plays an active role in Northwest Indiana, speaking to civic groups, directing PNW's Adult Continuing Education Program, Friday University, and hosting Purdue Northwest Today each Thursday morning on radio station WJOB. Tonight, um, Professor Rupp is going to speak to us on the topic of white supremacy. So um, please welcome our guest. And there we go. Sure. Hang on, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. Oh, hang on, hang on. Sorry. There we go. There we go. All right. Welcome, Professor Rupp. We're so glad you could be here. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, Deborah, D Dahlia, you know, I do this myself with um, managing my class. So you want to keep an eye on people still coming into the room. So there, there might be people coming in late. So, like my students do. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be happy to let them in. So, uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see the progressive Democrats of Laporte. I, I, I live in Munster, but I suppose not to be ideological, if I lived in Laporte, I'd be part of your organization. So uh, it's very nice to see you. That said, I'm not, uh, my job is a, as a social scientist, so I'm not going to be trying to be ideological in any way or persuade people of my views, but uh, it's very nice to see us all here tonight. Um, even though we're here on an extraordinarily disagreeable topic. Um, and if you want me to come in sometime to talk about, you know, great feats in Puccini in opera, uh, that, that might be a bit more enjoyable than talk about white supremacy and white nationalism and racism. But th that is our topic for tonight. So my plan is, again, given the size of our group, you know, I, I don't want to I'll be talking a bit, but I want to open this up uh, after 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes or so, to to comments and and questions, uh, and keep it more of as a, as a community conversation because I, I think actually that that's the best thing for the the nation at this point is for groups to be talking, but not not groups that look like us, right? Not all kind of um, post 55 seniors with gray white hair. Uh, the the you know I, I know where I'm. I think I'm kind of talking to the to the choir tonight, and that's great. But what we really need to figure out is how to expand that audience uh, to some of the folks in Laporte who might not uh, theoretically want to hear hear what we're talking about tonight, because that that's really the group that we need to reach out to and have these conversations these conversations with so i and i want to thank sarah and deborah for in, inviting me it's a, always a pleasure to be here i do a lot of community speaking in in the in the region and again as deborah said my, my field is actually uh, international politics uh, my um, i'm a political scientist uh and i'm born in california and went to uc santa barbara and so I've been in the Chicago area for about 25 years, happily. Um, and um, my work has focused on, as Deborah said, European security, American foreign policy, um, Middle East and Russian politics. So I, I say all that because I'm not an expert in um, white supremacy. And I have to tell you, I'm really glad that I'm not because 
uh, Deborah and uh, Sarah sent me on a couple of weeks of reading uh, to get ready for tonight. And this is not a particularly pleasant topic. It's an important topic, but uh, it's not a particularly uh, pleasant topic. Um, I've done a, a lot of reading. I've, 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 um, I've been on the FBI web pages, uh, the archives of the FBI, which does a great job with white supremacy, the Anti-Defamation League, Southern Poverty Center. So I feel my feel real reasonably well well uh, prepared for our conversation tonight. I would tell you that um, when I teach um, American politics, I don't do that too often because my field is international politics. But when I do teach, say, American government and American politics, I do spend a great deal of time on the African American experience in the United States. I I, I I suppose if I if I have a <clears throat> Uh, uh, um, a little bit, bit of a passion. I think this country would be an infinitely better place if all Americans were much more knowledgeable about their history, particularly in the context of the African American experience. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I think if folks really understood the numbers, the Supreme Court cases, the actions uh, by the American government, legally sanctioned by this republic and this democracy, we might be having a different conversation today. Um, so that's part that's part of my personal uh, commitment in having these conversations is just to uh, share that um, objective history because that's what it is. It's a very fact. It's a very factual history that not enough Americans are aware of. So what I'd like to do tonight. So I'd like to begin with a couple of definitions um, about white supremacy, but I but in my readings, I thought I decided it was really important for us not simply to talk about white uh, supremacy, but white nationalism, because I suppose I came away from this little journey of mine thinking that white nationalism is actually a greater threat to our safety and the health of the democracy than white supremacy. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that as I give you some, um, some thoughts about how we distinguish these. Obviously, racism is very much in the air throughout this. And then I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about the historical context of how we arrive uh, where we are today in, in 2021, uh, because it's, it's such a radically mixed bag. You know, we, we, what is it now? 12, 12 years ago, we inaugurated our first African American president. F five, six weeks ago, we inaugurated our first African American female vice president. But the times are so, so, so wrought with peril. Um, the, we've, left, we've left the Trump years not behind us, uh, but deeply affected by the direction that we're heading. So uh, with all that said, I'd like to talk, talk a little bit about the history of how we got here. And then I don't think I need to talk to you uh, too much about the Trump years. I think we can do that together. And then hopefully talk a little bit about where we, where we go from here. Uh, where, what, what, are, what are the next steps for groups like this, uh, for frankly, the Republican Party, uh, about how it examines itself and how the, how the nation examines itself. So that's my my little bit of a preview of, of, of where we're heading tonight. Again, I, I won't speak for uh, more than 25 minutes, and then um, we can reassemble uh, to take questions and comments uh, about about the topic. So in getting underway, I wanted to talk um, a little bit about this phrase white supremacy, because that's what I was asked to, to speak on. Um, so I did a deep dive into white supremacy from an academic perspective. And I would tell you there's, there aren't too many academic fields uh, that don't take a crack at trying to analyze white supremacy. So I, I'm a political scientist and certainly my field has done a great deal of work, but you know, you, you, you could rattle them off. Uh, his, my colleagues in history have done a great deal of work. Sociology, anthropology, uh, religious studies, economics, certainly psychology. Um, so th there's a real there's a real robust engagement in anal in analyzing white supremacy. One because it's been around for absolutely centuries, 
and it apps and it occupies us so directly in the world we're living in today especially in, a, in an america like today which is kind of a, a you know a postmodern society and yet here we are a postmodern society dealing with such guttural issues uh that um uh, really question uh, our our evolution as a democracy and as a representative republic that respects minority rights and human rights. So I did a good deal of, of looking around and I and I settled on what the Anti-Defamation League uses as its definition of white supremacy. And it's 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 four bullet points. I have I have one more that I would put in. But it's but it's pretty direct, and I think very helpful, because when I was reading these and thinking about these uh, descriptions of white supremacists, I said that speaks to too small of a group of what we should be talking about. We should be talking about a larger group. White supremacists are actually a reasonably small group uh, in the United States and in the world. Um, they are very potent and very dangerous and very violent, and they have been absolutely activated and supported in, in the last 10, five years in particular. But for my money, it's it's the white nationalists that are the, the bigger threat, the threat that they face to our society and culture. So just a few bullet points on white supremacy. So this would be definitional from the Anti-Defamation League, who we should all give money to periodically, like the Southern uh, Poverty Center. So one, uh, this perspective is whites should be should be the dominant, should be dominant over other people of other backgrounds. Very simple. Whites should be dominant over people of other backgrounds. Two, whites should live by themselves in white-only society. Whites should live by themselves in white-only society. Three, white people have their own culture that is superior to all other cultures. White people have their own culture that is superior to all other cultures. And number four, white people are genetically superior to all other peoples. White people are genetically superior to all other peoples. I have to tell you, I did not go on uh, many white supremacist web pages simply because I did not want that tag on my search engine. But this is what you would find if you went into the hundreds of white supremacist group in the United States and around the world. Hundreds of groups, but frequently with only dozens of members which is important. So looking back, oh, and there's and there's one that I decided to put in because I thought it was important. Um, and in my reading, I felt it was important to say, white supremacists embrace overt violence in their cause. White supremacists support and use violence in support of their cause. And you know we've and we've seen it all. Uh, again, I don't I don't know who's the oldest in our group, and I'm not going to ask. <laughs> but if we went back to the 1930s, as maybe some folks could, you know, we would see lynching. Um, and you know, you can't see him in my office, but one of my heroes is Franklin Roosevelt. I have to tell you, it's very painful for me. But Franklin Roosevelt actually did not support anti-lynching laws when they were proposed in the 1930s. It wasn't that he was a white supremacist. Um, it's just that in order to get his New Deal coalition and legislation through, he had to keep the South. And he didn't want to offend Southern senators and congresspersons. So Eleanor, of course, was uh, jumping up and down, but the president did not uh, support those, lo those laws. So um, when I look at the, when I date us back to the 1930s, though, I think, you know, we could all, we could have come up with a long list. Some of the most recent white supremacist acts of violence, uh, which we all witnessed uh, very close to home in Wisconsin in 2012, the 
massacre at the Sikh temple in Wisconsin, 2017, the horrifying massacre at the Emanuel AME Church in South Carolina, 2018, the attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. I had just been at that synagogue 10 days before. I was on a tour uh, with my colleagues in Northwest Indiana uh, about cities that are doing a great job uh, as far as retooling. Pittsburgh is a great story and that was a great synagogue. And then in 2019, we go overseas and we look at the Christchurch Mosque in New Zealand. There are many more, many examples, but I, what I thought was interesting about all of these is it spoke to white supremacist attack on Muslims, Jews, Sikhs, and Christians. That's not the only folks they go after, but that's the case here. So looking back historically, we can see the heavy hand of white supremacy in European colonialism and imperialism. The era really launches in the 15, early 1500s with Portugal and Spain. Um, and in the next 400 years, joined by, this, by the British and the French and the Dutch, um, the, the uh, entire globe would be colonized and there would be not a territory left. One of my maps that I use when I talk about colonialism um, with my students is a map of Africa in 1884, 85. Africa in 1884, 85, if you look at it, if you Google it tonight, you'll see there are almost no nation states in Africa, none. Uh, you, you have South Africa, you have Egypt, but very, very few states because the, the continent has yet to be carved up by the Europeans. If you look at the map in 1914, 30 years later, at the outset of World War I, the entire continent has been carved up by those European powers. And so that history of 500, 400 years, 450 years of colonialism and imperialism, you know, it witnesses the seizure of continents and peoples in the Americas and Asia and Africa, the introduction of the slave of slavery and the massive slave trade. And so again, I think I'm speaking to a, a, a rather well-versed group of folks tonight. So I don't think in obviously in a short period of time, we need to uh, do that sweeping history, but we know what transpired uh, from, from books, from, uh, from uh, frankly, some really excellent film that has emerged uh, to, to, chron to chronicle this story. But the physical acts, of course, of white supremacy the colonialism, the slave ships, the slave trade, the whippings, the murders, the torture. Um, this was augmented, of course, uh, the, the white supremacy by the pseudoscientists and the philosophers who gave intellectual arguments as to the science of white supremacy. So I, I, I gave you a few articles, if some of you had a glance at them, the, the, the Atlantic had a wonderful article by Adam Servers uh, white nationalism's deep, deep American roots, which really chronicles uh, uh, um, that story about, about again, pseudoscientists uh, and many, many politicians who bought into it, including American presidents, uh, believing that eugenics was overwhelmingly compelling. Uh, and, and then we see the, the history, not just in the US, um, uh, but we see it around the world. Um, we see it particularly in Africa uh, with the apartheid regime. I don't doubt looking at your pictures right now that any number of you uh, were in 1989, 1988, very angry with Ronald Reagan for how he uh, uh, engaged um, the South African government with the policy was called constructive engagement. Um, and but finally bringing down the apartheid regime and of course the regime in Rhodesia. So, so white supremacy has a long history. Um, it has uh, a history that was very much, very much characterized the governments of the, of the West and the societies of the West and, and the whites who dominated West, Western life. I think what we're going to see as we go forward is that th that 
perspective, those views, those, those, those five categories that I just described are frankly not shared by the hundreds of millions of people around the globe who shared them up through say the 1950s. Uh, in this area, actually, I think the world has made a good deal of progress uh, in marginalizing, limiting the impact of white supremacy. So in thinking about that, I didn't want you to think I was being Pollyannish uh, and uh, about you know, the, the state of the world. That's why I wanted to talk uh, about uh, white nationalism too, which as I said, in some ways concerns me more than, than white supremacy, which, I, which, which the Department of Homeland Security uh, considers the key threat to domestic safety in the United States which is extraordinary that that is the key threat to domestic security in the United States today. Um, I don't know if I would say that. I, I, I think I might say handguns are, are one, of, one of the key threats with the 14,000 people who are killed in homicides every year, uh, as opposed to the two or three in Japan that are killed every year. So I don't know if I would agree with that, but, 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 President Biden coming into office, as opposed to President Trump, has spoken overtly about the threat of white supremacy. So that, that is important in the context of looking at where we are now. But in looking at white nationalism, uh, I, I started thinking about that terminology and the, and the utility of that terminology as being perhaps more germane and um, useful in thinking about where we what we really need to be worried about. I am not in any way dismissing these white supremacist groups, these really disturbed, angry, violent individuals who are in the state of Indiana and in every other state in the union. Uh, but I'm a little bit more concerned about maybe the millions of people around the world, maybe even the low tens of millions around the people of the, around the world who either overtly identify as a white nationalist or quietly identify as a white nationalist. So a couple more points, uh, and, this, and my definition of white nationalism is not from, is, is from a, a collection of readings. So this is more my, my summation of white nationalism as opposed to the, uh, 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 Poverty Center uh, and the Anti-Defamation League. So I, I do I do think looking at them, white nationalists again, United States globally, there's definitely a, a belief in white suprem white superiority as a culture and as a race and as a history and as a religion. There's definitely a strong sense of superiority. There's also, especially when we think about it today in 2021. I, I see white, white nationalists wanting to maintain and even celebrate white culture, politics, and economics, excuse me, celebrate the dominance of the presence of a white culture and white politics and white economics. I see that very clearly um, within individuals who I would see embracing a sense of white nationalism. White nationalists tend to celebrate their history. They're very proud of their version of history. So when I look at white nationalists in the United States, I don't see any apologies for slavery or the slave trade or Plessy versus Ferguson or uh, Dred Scott uh, or the Civil War or Jim Crow or the black codes, or lynching, or the segregation of the armed forces. I don't see any wish to revisit that history. I see a wish to celebrate a version uh, of American history. I also see within uh, white nationalist, an and this is not a surprise, of course, but an absolute opposition to seeking to redress any wrongs 
that might have been committed by the American government, by the American legal system, by the governments of the various states, by the societies, by the educational institutions. I don't see any wish to redress historic wrongs. Not surprisingly, they don't want to redress anything that they don't think was terribly wrong to begin with. I see white nationalist as deeply, deeply threatened by the changing world that we're living in. I'll, I can say more about this later when we talk a little bit about the, the Trump base, if you will, which by the way, I do not consider overwhelmingly white nationalist or white supremacist. I see a great deal of racism, but I like to be careful in how I use terminology. I see white nationalists um, denying their obvious racism, being absolutely oblivious that they are racist and absolutely denying that they are white nationalists. So, so this is why I like to differentiate the, these terms because one I see as very definitional, very targeted, reasonably small, if extraordinarily public when they act out. Uh, and then the white nationalist as frankly a greater threat. Um, because if you're, if, 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 you're, if, you're a, if you're a white supremacist, you're a white nationalist. I'm, I don't think necessarily if you're a white nationalist, you're a white supremacist. Um, I think you're all racist, uh, deeply committed to a level of, of, of uh, structural, structural racism. So having, having said that, um, we all know the history of the West, uh, particularly the United States, and it's a long history, frankly, of, of white supremacy, white nationalism, and racism. Now, again, not going not gonna to cover 400 years of history with you. Um, but you know, we, we begin with the colonial experience. Uh, we move into you know, slavery and the slave trade. And from my perspective as a political scientist, I am always shattered talking about the birth of the nation and how, it, how a nation was so, who so eloquently articulated Republican governance and democracy was so absolutely racked with this structural white supremacy. Uh, as you all know, in the Constitution, but also in the laws and the Supreme Court cases that would come down for the next 150 years. Honestly, I, I think 500 years from now, someone looking at American history will come in and say, wow, you white people were absolutely terrified by these African Americans because you were utterly, utterly preoccupied. I mean, if you look at that newspapers, uh, local newspapers, um, and court cases and state legislative rulings in all of the states, you'll see the preoccupation of managing the African race. It's really, it's really breathtaking to look at this. Um, but that, of course, that's not the entire story of white supremacy, Indian removal, manifest destiny. Not enough people know about the US history in the Philippines in uh, 1898, um, the Ku Klux Klan, Chinese exclusion, Jim Crow laws, eugenics. It, it's, it's, an, it's an extraordinary indictment against a, a, a country that continues to have leaders on the right and the left, Republican and Democrat, conservative and liberal still say, this is the greatest country in the history of the world. I tell my students that I travel the world a lot and I know almost no leader or, or other peoples who are so brazen as to tell that to you on arrival. Uh, I, I tell my students, if I told you I was the best professor at Purdue Northwest, you should probably drop me. Why, what is it ab about us that requires even President Obama to use terminology such as that? Well, following World War II, um, overt white supremacy started to, started to recede. It started in some ways to fight as opposed to being a fully accepted and normal part of political and social and economic life 
white supremacy started to uh, fight a rear guard battle because values and opinions were changing. Um, some of those changes, of course, were not driven just not in the U.S., but actually at the U.N. You know, the, U the U.N. comes into existence in 1945 uh, with a very explicit rejection of white supremacy and white and white nationalism, uh, really embracing more of a, a liberal internationalism. Um, you all, I made reference to Franklin Roosevelt, uh, now reference to Eleanor Roosevelt. You know, if you go back and read the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's a it's a staggering statement about where the UN is in 1945 and, and where it wants to take the world in the years to come. It's, a, it's an incredibly detailed document that does go into racism and white and white supremacy and minority rights. And over the years, the UN would go on through at the General Assembly to write any number of multinational treaties uh, and conventions dealing with discrimination and um, uh, civil rights um, and civil liberties um, that really started to give a, a codified understanding of what were the norms of a liberal democracy that all nations should aspire to and actually adhere to. Of course, in the United States, um, 1964, 65, 68, brings around the Civil Rights Acts, the Voting Rights Act, residency, and, and you see, you see the, the concrete back of white supremacy begin to crack because now the, the Jim Crow laws, which are absolutely epitomized white supremacy, are formally, at least legally, taken off the books. It would require many decades, and we're still in that period, of trying to bring those laws into fruition. You know, as we all know, uh, racism remains alive and well. I think white nationalism, unfortunately, remains uh, alive and well. Um, the Great Society began uh, in all, all of our lifetimes, I think, uh, and it has been through fits and false starts that has, it has gone forward. Um, there is a very clear um, number, percentage of Americans who are adamantly opposed to taking a serious look at our history. Um, there's a sense among, among many, and it goes back to the early 70s with affirmative action, that, that that would be a wrong to try to redress those issues. They should be left behind. Um, we have scholar after scholar and group after group. They don't need to be scholars. They can be, I, I had two African women on my radio show last week who did a brilliant job talking about Black Lives Matter so you don't need to be a scholar to, to talk about to talk about the obvious. We the country is still racked with housing issues, educational issues, criminal justice issues, economic wealth issues. Just COVID has been an astounding statement. The differentiation between African Americans and Caucasian Americans about about their health uh, and their access to health. The um, Numbers were out last year on life expectancy. They're actually they're just out on 2020 life expectancy. The overall is down by one year for all Americans, but it's that one year is compared to 2.7 years for African Americans. So what the hell is that about, other than other than a long long legacy? So here we are now. I'm looking at the time. Here we are now. During the past 12 years, um, this country elected its first African-American president who confronted a great deal of racism during his presidency. With extraordinary patience and grace, many of his liberal supporters thought too much grace and too much dignity. Five years ago, we elected a man who clearly embraces white nationalism and very deliberately fueled racism, both through his rhetoric and through his concrete actions. And yet 
70 million Americans voted to reelect him, even though his record was as chronicled as chronicled could be because he wanted it to be chronicled. So what makes this possible? This 2021 that we're in where, where uh, Kamala Harris could be inaugurated vice president and the kind of heinous white supremacist acts continue and the sort of structural racism and institutional actions against African-Americans are still so prominent. Well, I think it's possible because of our history um, and, the, and the fact that so many Americans fail to look at their history. They do not want to examine it. They do not want to hear it. Uh, they are also this, this um, racism, this white nationalism, the supremacy. Um, I think it's fueled in part by the growing diversity in the United States. This, I mean, look at us all tonight. This is not a very diverse group uh, of Americans, um, but the country is growing dramatically diverse. My home state of California uh, is, is, I don't know the percentage of Hispanics right now, but I, I believe within just the next few years, Caucasians will be the minority uh, ethnicity uh, in, the, in, the state of Calif in the state of California. Um, but this diversity is scaring the hell out of certain Americans. Not all white Americans by any stretch of the imagination, but a certain percentage, a certain demographic of Americans are absolutely petrified by this and wallow in incredible ignorance and lack of information. Uh, they see this group as you know, of white culture no longer dominating the media or Hollywood. They can't believe what their kids are watching, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're appalled. They, they, they haven't seen Leave it to Beaver in 35 years. Uh, they can't believe that gay and lesbians are kissing and making love basically on, on, on the airwaves. They, they are absolutely mortified by this, by this new world that you know, General Eisenhower really didn't envision. I mentioned Eisenhower because uh, obviously Eisenhower uh, would not have been a big fan, I think, of the last president. But you know, we always refer to the 1950s as the good old days. Not so much. <laughs> you know, ask African Americans, even if they escaped Mississippi. Uh, in 1930, asked them if the Iowa and Nebraska and Chicago were all that great in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Not so much. It was, it was better than Jim Crow, Mississippi. So we see this declining American white middle class and working class. White males in particular, high school educated, uh, who 30 years ago, 35 years ago, 20 years ago, we're okay uh, having a decent living and being able to raise their family. And, and they might not have even been, they, they, they might have been your Archie Bunker racist, uh, but it wasn't their whole identity. It was, it wasn't, they, they didn't see their world crumbling. Uh, but now a lot of this group sees their, their world crumbling. They're, they're having to work harder than they ever had. They don't have the same sort of respect in their, in their labor as they once had. They are absolutely dec in decline in context of keeping up with the cost of living. Healthcare spirals, they, if, the, if, if they wanna help their granddaughter go to college, uh, their granddaughter doesn't need just $500, she needs $5,000 to help her out. He doesn't have that. So we're, we're looking at all of these factors going on simultaneously. And then we see, frankly, a, a brilliant politician, a populist politician, uh, Donald Trump, seizing upon all this, uh, being, being solely focused really not on an ideology, not on a philosophy, uh, but simply on being in power. And so he, he, knew, he knew how to manipulate and, and speak to a certain segment of society. And he was enormously successful in coming to power. I don't know if any of us five years ago thought it would be frankly quite this bad 
Um, but we all watched the last five years. Um, and again, I'm not going to chronicle now the, the last five years, um, but uh, it shouldn't have been a surprise to us. Um, his, uh, his record as uh, a business uh, developer in New York was well chronicled as far as the racist policy, cl classic zonism, you using the z zoning laws. Um, the birther movement, you know, three, four years before he even ran for president was telling. Um, we all watched him announce his, his uh, candidacy. David Duke, among others, supporting him. Donald Trump saying, who's David Duke? He knew exactly who David Duke was. The messaging was always there. Shithole countries, suburban wives, good people on both sides. Um, it was, well, we all know what it was and we all have our own reaction to it. Um, I would tell you though, it didn't end on uh, January the, the 20th. Um, this will long shape us. Uh, it will long, long affect us just like the pandemic um, you have a very different kind of president, a very different kind of administration, but you have tens of millions of Americans who have been activated by this kind of politics, the politics of a cult leader. Um, these tens of millions of Americans, again, not identifying themselves as white supremacists, and the vast majority are not, not identifying themselves as white nationalists, although many are, are on a, a certain spectrum. Uh, and utterly unwilling to acknowledge their own racism. So we have, we, so the struggle continues, you know, and I'm 57, I'll be giving this lecture at 87, uh, and then I'm gonna go to bed. Um, but you know, this, this, this is our, it's our original sin uh, and, it, and it continues. And so, and it ebbs, and you know, and it ebbs and flows. Who, know, who knows that what the next four years will be like? I have to confess, um, I'm a little concerned that um, you know uh, President Biden might not serve out his four years for whatever reason, um, and I and I and we can see the po the popularity right now of President Biden in the poll numbers. Um, that and that will go down, and and it will go up, and it will go down. I really worry about him not being in office. Let's say he passes away, uh, and Kamala Harris becomes president. I was honestly shocked um, in the months after Barack Obama became president um, about how comfortable, frankly, the Republican Party was in going after Barack Obama, uh, and in part very much as, a, as an African-American. Um, probably more worried about how that would transpire with Kamala Harris. So that doesn't bode well. Um, but um, in, this, in the spirit of the folks that I interact with constantly, young people, people around Northwest Indiana, uh, people with a smidgen of education and humanity and kindness, um, you know, we'll see where we go. So I think I'm gonna cease there. I think I spoke for more than 30 minutes, I apologize. And again, the, I'm very happy not to take questions, but to hear your comments or respond in any way I can. So thank you. I'm not sure how good my mic quality is. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. All right, yeah. Uh, hi, my name's Jack. I'm 19. I live in Millport County. Uh, and I'm I'm not a liberal or a Democrat. Uh, I'm a little bit further left than that. Uh, a lot of people on who are younger might, you, you know, might seem foreign to you, but we identify usually with, with communism or anarchism. Uh, and I know that's scary, but I, I have a couple of points I'd like to talk about just because well, as long uh, as you're not a Trotskyite or a or Stalin. No, oh no, I'm not an authoritarian. We're all on board. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm the other end of it. I'm. I'm anti-government. Ah, uh, you're Bakarin. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I had a little thing typed up. White supremacy and white nationalism isn't necessarily always right or left wing. Uh, usually, it's whatever uh, the easiest path to accomplish their goal is, which is to create a power structure that puts us on top and everybody else gradually lower. 
So what they've been doing for the past, you know, 400 years or so in the United States is they've been us- utilizing capital and uh, to cripple uh, financially and culturally uh, minorities and specifically uh, indigenous people and African-American population here. And um, it often with the aid of the government, often with uh, at least, you know, the complacency of the government. Um, everything from like redlining to police violence, and obviously there's slavery. Uh, people with power and uh, racist intent have been using, you know, have been using it. So I, I, the problem isn't just racism; it's also capital, the accumulation of wealth in the hands of the few uh, that allows people with those kind of ideas to have so much influence over our culture. And uh, Another, another thing, uh, just on Barack Obama, uh, it, him being the first black president sounds like a really progressive thing. Um, but I, I've, I've done a lot of uh, reading on this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, he was the, the best I can say about him is that he accomplished, you know, a gay marriage that was pretty good. Um, but he was effectively a bank crony. Uh, he worked with a lot of people from Citibank and immediately gave a lot of executives jobs in the White House when he got elected, uh, which sounds like a weird thing to do when your promise was to change stuff. And then you take the people who crashed the housing market and put them in charge again and then build them out. So I, I'm, 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 I have mixed feelings about Obama. And then there's the whole drone strike thing. But I think mostly we're all on the same page here. Uh, white supremacy is a huge huge issue. I, I've, I've got a lot of passion about this kind of stuff. I, and I, uh, I do street activism in a port when, when the, you know, stuff arises, I've traveled for it. And, uh, I just wanted to say a couple words while I had the, had the time and the people That's, here. I, I'm sorry. And your name is Jack. Jack. Jack yeah. I, um, I th- so, sorry. um, I'm going to give you a, a, a title of a book. Um, it's called empire of cotton and I can't recall the author's name, Sven. He's a Harvard professor, Empire of Cotton, because I think it really speaks to what you're talking about, about capitalism, because you really can't understand, that's the thrust of his work, you really can't understand the, really the birth of, of capitalism in, in, the, in the Industrial Revolution um, and its growth without understanding the role of cotton and slavery. Slavery was absolutely pivotal to building modern capitalism. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the only variable, but it was a singularly important variable. And because so often when we think of cotton, we just think of the South. No, 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 no. That, that, that's, that's the mills in the North and the traders in the North and the, and the consumerism to, and the totality. So I, I don't disagree with you there, uh, there, Jack, at all. I think it's, it's, it's an important component to bring up. Yeah, uh, to, to wrap up just my little thing that I had typed out, I, I, I think we need to put uh, as a country a bigger priority on human life over, ca- uh, over profit. Because uh, there's a whole party that kind of everybody agrees is just the villains. And it's a popular party. And they, they clearly don't prioritize human life, you know, no free health care, they, they treat us like cattle uses for their companies and if they if we die and we die so lost they're willing to accept so i think we need to be taking care of people's basic human rights as like a top priority we need to move that way up uh and that's really all i wanted to say for now uh Thank you. anybody else wanted to take a turn thanks for letting me speak hey, you know, i have a question um you um have talked about white nationalists and white supremacists um and i wonder in your reading where do people like the three percenters, the oath keepers, you know, who are really more aligned with um, militias, armed militias, and really um, are focused on really um, overturning the government? Um, and how does that fit in with this, uh, you know, this paradigm of the white supremacy? Because they do seem very much aligned. Yeah, they are. They aren't because you know. Well, let's you know. Take, we've we've all read a good bit about the individuals and the kind of groups who seize the capital on January the 6th. You know, and so it would be not accurate to refer to them all as white supremacists, or I, I think there was a very, very healthy dollop of white nationalism there. This was clearly a white movement. There were no 
There were virtually no uh, faces of color in that movement, but um, anti-government was a huge part of this, uh, this movement. Frankly, the cult of Trump was a big factor in this movement. Uh, militia groups, uh, more often than not, find themselves within the camp of white supremacy. Um, we, we know that, that's you know, the FBI, the, all, all, the data show, all the data shows that oh, there's an overwhelmingly, overwhelming presence of white supremacy, homophobia, Islamophobia. Um, but, the, um, but, the, but, um, but that doesn't mean that all militias you know, are grounded in white supremacy. Um, you know, a, the, the, you know this, the, a, a, a blinding rage of government. Uh, I, I, was on, I was on the radio this week and an individual literally said that he, uh, he, he's 65 years old, he's working three jobs and the only reason why he's working is to pay these outrageous taxes. Um, you know, that, that sort of simplicity in his mind frame is, is, you know, this idea that the government is taking everything from him. And, he, and that's been fueled by, uh, frankly, by right wing media uh, for, for, de for decades now. Well, I guess what I, what I have seen is that um, the people who call themselves the three percenters or the oath keepers who are these kind of armed militias, you know, they, they seem to be able to, you know, move about openly <laughs> where white supremacists, you know, don't often. And so, well, um, yeah, I, th but, I think you're, I think, I mean, I, I did read about quite, a, you know, a, there's, there's quite an interesting subculture here, right? Because um, pr prior to social media, certainly prior to the pandemic, these groups could meet, you know, there were you know, camps in I Idaho, camps in Indiana, frankly, where you get these mostly men, mostly ma white male men, uh, frequently younger, you know, 20s, 30s, uh, in their camouflage outfits, and they're out with their uh, high powered rifles and automatic weapons. Um, and they're, they're focused on th the threat to their existence uh, the, the, the idea that the government is this ominous force um, and, and, fre and frequently that their world is being upended and they have to defend traditional American values. Now, when, any, when, any, when these groups say traditional American values, my, my, my flags go up because that's usually a hint about the history that we've been talking about, that they, 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 yearn, they yearn for that period in which folks like them were uh, not question. That, that and just to, I just want to bring it home a little bit because of what happened in our Indiana state legislature this past week. And, and that's exactly what it was. It was uh, legislators who consider themselves, you know, three percenters, um, kind of this militia, um, a second amendment purists, etc. But what they were doing uh, was, you know, as you said earlier, trying to manage um, people of color who had you know, every right to be speaking about their lived experience, but, um, you know, we're being, you know, heckled. Um, and, and so, so those were where those, in my mind, those two groups really did merge in our state legislature. Well, um, it's the Indiana legislature is currently con uh, considering a few pieces of legislation about regulating protests in, uh, in Indiana. And they're frankly, wildly unconstitutional. Uh, but they're really they're really designed to stymie peaceful protest, and it really demonstrates the power of how the Black Lives Matter protests were char characterized last year. They were overwhelmingly peaceful, um, mm -hmm. and but if you listen to the right wing news, if, if you if you watch the television uh, commercials that the Republicans and President Trump put out you know, the country was on fire all, all of last year. And so you're going to have to have this kind of legislation in order to keep these people down. And again, that's fueling the base. That's, that's just, that's frankly what we call feeding the beast. I have, uh, I have something to add. So the same people, these same right-wing militias, uh, the Proud Boys, all, all these, you know, practically open fascists that have taken over, uh, you know, the streets in some places, They'll, they'll, they'll talk about deep states and, you know, 
conspiracies about all sorts of people controlling the media, all sorts of people controlling, you know, funding the Black Lives Matter protests instead of protesting. I would just like saying we don't like black people, which is what they really mean. They say we don't like BLM because they can say they don't like an organization and they can say and then they can say like, oh, it's funded by George Soros and he's trying to make everybody communist. It's a whole rabbit hole. But then they'll fail to recognize corruption when it comes in the form of lobbying uh, for the president of the United States, for example. Lobbyists are basically just people trying to get politicians to do their bidding by the use of a little bit of extra cash on the side. And I see that as corruption. That's to me that that's that's outright corruption. That that's just become normalized to the point where people don't really complain about it anymore. And uh, yeah, that was my, that was my comment. Sorry. It, it's a very good one. Thank you. Don't disagree at all. Thank you. I have a I have a question. Can you speak at all about the um, Hammerskin Nation group that was very active in the Pines along with the neo Nazi um, organization? I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't explore that. But maybe because, you can share. Well, I know a little bit. Um, they were always listed. The uh, Southern Poverty Law Center puts out an annual report, right. and in that report, they list all of the different um, hate groups that are present within each state. And the Pine, they have always listed the Pines until the last couple years. Um, and it was called, it was a really a um, skinhead, racist skinhead organization, and this Hammerskin Nation which I just found out said it was one of the most violent groups around. Um, they have sort of disappeared because many of their members have um, turned and joined either the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers, um, so you don't see them. But the uh, they haven't, excuse me, the Pines hasn't been listed in their latest annual report, and I tried to get hold of them to find out why, if they're no longer there. Um, now, I, would, other... I would also be surprised that there's a lot of internal violence in these groups. These are violent people and hate, very deeply hateful people. And so they frequently, they also turn on themselves. What, one of the most uh, distressing places to find white supremacy in the United States right now is in the federal prison system. Uh, there are very significant numbers of gangs uh, very much focused on white supremacy. Yeah. Uh, and... and Oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to suggest that point. And also black gangs and Hispanic gangs, they're all divided up in the prison systems. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, there's all right. But the one thing that I was really interested uh, here, if you could talk a little bit about, was women as part of this process. If we go back to the Constitution, um, they weren't able to vote and they weren't be able to do anything. And so now today, though, we see a lot of women on February the 6th. As January part of that. 6th. Right. Mm -hmm. January. Oh, right. January, excuse me. Right. January 6th as part of that group. So how does that happen? Well, again, I, I, I don't want to um, overly, overly generalize. I mean, you, you're right. There was a, there's a great deal of, of women, uh, very small groups of people of color uh, in, in that, and frankly, in the Trump base and, and camp. Um, uh, I don't know if I have a real great grasp uh, of, um, of differentiating male supporters for Trump and female supporters for Trump. So I, I, I'd, have to think, I'd have to think about that. Well, while you're thinking about that, um, <laughs> you know, let, me, let me suggest that religion has a big part in this process too. And we haven't talked a lot about we that. But you're, but you're absolutely right um, that religion is, has been central to it, uh, especially in the motivations for some, some, of the, some of the motivations for colonialism, because the, the early motivations for colonialism and imperialism were mostly about wealth and power. I mean, the, the Spaniards, and, and, the, the Spaniards and, and the Portuguese were out for gold bullion and silver. Um, but as, as colonialism grew, um, and, and it became a wider movement, then the uh, religious identities of the European countries, which were all, all Christian, Catholic, uh, overwhelmingly, but, uh, but also Protestants, beca became central to it. Uh, and, and, you know, and America would join that too. When, when, the, when the United States became more active in the Middle East, you know, our, our first 
um, um, uh, colonizers, if you will, our, our first, uh, um, those individuals first landing in the Middle East were, were there to spread Christianity. Um, and and if you and you if you take a look at you know again the the white man's burden uh, in in the Philippines uh, that was very much grounded if you you know, manifest de destiny Christianity is all over it. So um, another book that I would I kind of like to I kind of like to plug that I really enjoyed about this topic is some, it's called the Enchantments of Mammon how capitalism became the religion of. Uh, the modern west i believe hang on of modernity that's that's the one uh and it dives into really interesting topics like how uh the puritans and the the people who initially came to colonize, colonize the united states from britain uh were extremists in the way they took christianity in a, in a way that uh and that uh, prioritized the gaining of wealth and, pr and production and doing work as like a, a primary virtue. And they sought to terraform the land and- Let's see, Jack, you still with us? We don't, we don't want to lose Jack. He froze there for a second. Yeah, he froze. He'll come back. So I, I see have, Angie I... has her hand up and then, and, then, um, and then we'll go back to you, Kathy. Okay. Um, yes, uh, one of the things that we've witnessed, um, particularly thanks to Trump, uh, was this concept that almost borderline indoctrination, like we have got to remove the negative parts of our history, that a focus on the reality that we were in fact a country based on colonialism and uh, very much white nationalism and racism uh, is topics we shouldn't be teaching our children um, and also a pushback when say a large company tries to um, teach white fragil uh, fragility and teach people that you know you do have racist underlying understandings of your world. My question is how do we respond to that? Because it's, it's, it's almost as if teaching the truth, people are beginning to become very much attacked um, and they, they fight back very hard. Uh, just simply when you mention the truth, like you become the bad person for saying white people are, you know, we have this history because then they say all of a sudden we're just, we're, telling people they are racist just because they're white. And that's, I think, what people have started saying. It's really, I, don't I mean, know if that makes sense. It's, <laughs> it makes sense, but it's really tough, right? I mean, America has a long, long history of anti-intellectualism. That, that's, that's, you know, that's almost one of our core values uh, that, you know, pointy headed intellectuals, you really don't want to hear from them because they haven't pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. And so, you know, we, we see that um, throughout, throughout American history, even though the, you know, the framers were probably the smartest class of politicians we've ever had. I, and I say that in the context of how many languages Madison and company spoke, how learned they were. Um, but we've had a long history of anti-intellectualism. Of anti and so you get, a, you get a public then that views um, a, a, a discourse that is frankly factual, non-ideological, um, as problematic because they see it as unpatriotic. You know, to, to to look at American history the way we have tonight, and you know, I, I have I have been slanted tonight. So we're talking about white supremacy, um, but you know, uh, I I am not um, uh, a person who runs away from uh, the the strengths and the accomplishments of this country. I'm pretty frustrated by it, frankly, uh, on the whole, but I think it's been, uh, frankly, a remarkable journey um, of, of, of largely progress. Uh, my field is international politics, so I spend a lot of time overseas. And um, there are, frankly, there are other countries. If my spouse said, you know, do you want to spend the next three years in Finland or Sweden or, or Denmark? Uh, I might say, well, that sounds kind of cool. 
Um, I've also spent a lot of time though in the country of Oman, which is in, a, in, the, middle, in the Middle East. It has very little to do with democracy, but it is a, a, a really beautiful society. Uh, and, um, but this, this issue that you raise is so tough. And, you know, and I look at it in some of our Indiana legislature, legislators. And um, you know, I, um, I know Hal Slager, who's one of the who recently won uh, election back to the House. And you know, Hal, Hal strikes me as one of those, you know, those Dick Luger um, Republicans. Now, honestly, I, pr I probably would not have voted for Dick Luger uh, because that's, he's, those are just not my politics. But you know, Dick Luger was a pretty profoundly decent fellow. So, so is Hal Slager. And they live in the world of this changing climate. Um, you know, I grew up, a lot of you grew up, and you know, you, the names of the, of, the, of the Senate, you know, in the 70s, you know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Teddy Kennedy, Bob Dole, uh, Howard Baker, Dick, Dick Luger. I mean, it was, it was an entirely different world as opposed to these, these individuals that now occupy positions of senior power. I mean, Ted Cruz, um, and, and the, but, but they support <laughs> the, 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 the Ted Cruz's are very happy to support the, the, the Texas uh, uh, textbook revisions that really want to squash American history. And, and so, you know, what the hell do we, what the hell do we do with that? Uh, and so it's, 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 you know, I, I, I'm about ready to get out of show business. I want to retire and, and, and go to the opera um, because it's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a t very tough slog and it's, and it's frankly a battle. Um, and, it, and you'd like to think that um, the discourse could be sober, you know, uh, part of those, the, the, the art of politics is the art of compromise. And those primarily white men who were running the Senate in the, in the 1970s had a hell of a lot more understanding of compromise than what we have today. And the media. Oh, I'm sorry, and, good. we'll go to Kathy and then David's got his hand up and, and I'm sorry, Jack, I wanna let David get a, a, you know, a little a time yeah. too. So no Kathy, worries, no worries. I'll go to you first. I, I have just a quick, I think, question. Um, are you aware of any country or groups that have been successful in um, working with people uh, who belong to these very violent white supremacist groups and um, being able to, I guess, change their minds or, or make them see the... Um, I, haven't done, I haven't done a deep enough dive into that, um, Kathy, to, to, to look at that. I, I would tell you that um, with, in, particularly in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, um, we're more concerned about these very successful liberal democracies slipping uh, in part because of the migration issues coming out of North Africa and the Middle East. You know, we're, we're seeing not, I'm not gonna say white nationalists, but we're seeing right wing parties um, come to uh, become much more prominent in places that you would have never seen them before, like Finland, Denmark, uh, Norway, uh, uh, Holland, um, and 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 the German government is very concerned uh, about because um, the German government is one of the few that bans p political parties, uh, and that and that's you know that's a walk, particularly when larger numbers of main quote unquote mainstream Germans are getting a bit more conservative. But no, I don't. But I, unfortunately, I don't. I don't have a, a good answer to that. I mean, I suppose I would talk about. Um, in the spirit of a country that in some ways is an extraordinary uh, statement would be South Africa. You know, the, the post-apartheid period and, and the Truth and Reco Reconciliation Commission. Argentina did something along those, time, along those lines too, but it wasn't so much about race. It was about the violence perpetrated by the junta in the 70s. But, but certainly South Africa is an extraordinary testament but, you know, but so much of that was about, about Nelson Mandela and about his ability to hold such a country like that to get together. Um, you know, a lot, you know, there are some Democrats and some certainly academics who would like to see America to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission now about the Trump years and for, and for, for because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission wasn't just about documenting what happened during the horrors of apartheid, 
It was about how to build a new country and about how to go forward and how not to have groups like this. Um, because because I, you know, I don't read, I mean, I, I'm not on every South African webpage, but I don't read too much about white supremacy in South Africa today. Of course, they, a lot of them fled to other countries. Should we take a couple more questions and everybody can either have dinner or have a drink? Well, I think we'll do, we'll do one more. David uh, has had his hand up and then, um, and then we'll wrap up. I did want to mention that on NPR, um, they, yesterday, they did a really extensive piece on indoctrination into these uh, white supremacy or, yeah. um, you know, or militia groups. And I certainly uh, recommend- well, that's, what, that's why I mentioned psychologists studying this, because, because this is something that, you know, this is something that if, if you were in Langley, Virginia, which is the head of uh, headquarters of CIA, you know, they, they take a real deep dive into these psychological profiles. What, and the FBI as well, of course, uh, at Guantanamo. <laughs> About what attracts people, how how are how are they brought in, how they how then they can they be deprogrammed? But go ahead, David. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, this question uh, is addressed to uh, either uh, uh, Professor Grupp or uh, or Jack. Uh, as uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I I've had the uh, uh, good fortune of of uh, Growing up in a an eclectical community uh, that was in Hyde Park in Chicago, then in Evanston and uh, in Belgium, an exchange program. But uh, my question to you each uh, would be: Do either of you have any suggestions for uh, young people in how to make more affiliations with people? that are like-minded or diversely minded uh, that uh, would be an interesting uh, uh, in the, uh, interesting uh, uh, peoples who uh, uh, would help uh, fulfill you. I, I was starting to mention that I had a good friend by the name of Sinclair uh, in South Bend who uh, gave me a lot of motivation politically, and he was an activist. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, anyway, uh, any suggestions that you would have for young people? Why don't you go for it, Jack? All right, so uh, to start, uh, it was pretty hard for me to find people that had, that shared my political leanings in my town. You know, my, my, my parents raised me uh, on the left as a, as a liberal a uh, Democrat or a social a socialist Democrat. Um, but I find that finding online communities is often the uh, go-to route these days. Uh, unfortunately, this goes for both the left and the right. And I'm actually about to link in the chat a uh, video playlist from YouTube. It's called the Alt-Right Playbook, uh, How They Radicalize Normal Teenagers. It's a whole series on it, and it goes into the psychology of the alt-right and their online communities. It's very well researched, um, and it looks a little bit silly from the outside because it's a thumb thumbnail, but it, it, it's, a, it's a great series, and I recommend you guys check this out. Um, but I think we need to be focusing on having a larger outreach to places that, you know, Youth, youth in Utah, you know, in Mormon Utah, need to be able to get uh, get to these communities too. And I, it's important to recognize that the right is a community of strength. And by that, I mean it's isolationist, and your worth is dependent on your ability to do something for the group. And that can lead to a kind of an abusive situation, and even in these online communities where. Uh, they separate you from people. They start telling you, don't talk to people on the left in your family. Don't talk to these certain people. You know, they, they cut you away from everybody else. And then once you have them, that's all you can go back to. You've already posted a bunch of Nazi stuff online. You can't turn back and it feels hopeless. So being on the right is kind of like an abusive relationship. Uh, it, it, it's like an abusive relationship. Uh, but we need to be fostering more uh, communities of vulnerability because that's what the left is built on. Uh, people who share uh, vulnerabilities and who share uh, uh, they've been oppressed in the same ways and that's how that's how I make friends that's how all my friends you know uh, I'm for example uh, I'm pansexual I date any gender and 
I'm 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 queer. I'm I, I'm I'm part of a group that, on the right, if we compromise with them, that's my human rights. You know, that's my right to get married. That's my that's my right to live. You know, so I feel like we need to be focusing on creating communities of vulnerability among the youth that where we can communicate these ideas to each other, uh, and we need to. Uh, what was I saying? Well, you, you get the idea. That, uh, that's about that. That's about wraps it up. I, I hope I, you know, did all right. You did, and and I don't disagree with Jack. I think th those are uh, important ways of communicating and building uh, strength. But I also think it's important for at least for people like me to be willing to go out and talk to uh, the Elks Club and Rotary and Catholic Services where I would probably find not, you know, 18 like-minded Caucasian liberals of one uh, shade or another, um, but where I'm going, I'm going to have a, a reasonable conversation with hopefully reasonable people. I mean, I very seldom find myself in a shouting match simply because I'm trained not to be in right. shouting matches. So like when, when I do WJOB, I do get some really nasty uh, callers. Um, from and they are on the right and the racism is really pronounced. So my when I talk to that individual, I'm really not talking to that individual. I'm actually addressing the three or 400 people who are listening at that time who might have some sympathy for that person or at least find them entertaining. And then they're listening to me, a pretty sober, rational guy talking primarily factually and not angry. I think that is a big way of you know, coming to some level of compromise and not demonization across the board. Again, uh, Jack, I, don't, I, have, I have to tell you, I don't have a lot of right-wing friends. Uh, I, I, when, I was a, when I was your age, I tell you, in California, I worked for Reagan Bush. So I started out as a, a young Republican. Uh, but that was because my parents were uh, liberal Democrats and I was rebelling. Um, so, um, well, imagine, imagine, imagine rebelling by doing some conservatism. Uh, well, my point is that you know, it's, it. Unfortunately, we do live in a world that it is it, we, that it is difficult um, to have relations, good friendships with people who are, well, one, frankly, profoundly ignorant. And then, we're, and then wear that aggressively. Uh, that, that's a pretty challenging uh, road. Jack, are, are you uh, attending a college or should we get you into mine? Uh, I'm, I'm not currently attending higher education. I, I, I was going to Ivy Tech Valparaiso, but uh, I stopped that because I realized that it's not, it's, it wasn't a career I wanted. Oh, I was it's, studying. A, it's a bourgeois construct. For oh, a yeah. To <laughs> totally, totally, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, Okay, so I, shall we shall we wrap up, Deborah and Could Sarah? I just, just say something yeah. quickly Go for a minute. Go ahead. Kyle. You know, in, in in answer to what we need to do ourselves, the first thing we need to do is we need to be aware ourselves, and we need to learn ourselves, and then we need to teach. You know, the Civil War is still going on. Yeah. And I see that every day. Every time I see a flag, every time I see an army base is named after some asshole general, you know. And so with my kids and stuff and with my friends and where I worked uh, before, then it was my responsibility to learn. So if somebody says to you, well, I carry this gun because of the Second Amendment, then I would say to them, let's sit down and read the Second Amendment together and yeah, look at it like or we that. were seeing it is it doesn't give you the right to carry a gun unless you're a militia. So, I, you know, so that's one of the small things I think we all can do, you know, we well, can learn as and teach as ourselves. Along those lines, you can also learn pretty quickly about what they think is right and just demolish them. I mean, the, the, the folks who, um, uh, on the Second Amendment, especially when they rally behind the, the NRA, the NRA is one of the most corrupt, uh, yeah divisive organization. I mean, it, it, from political science perspective, it's one of the most effective, has been one of the most effective uh, political interest groups in the country. But if you know about the NRA and you know what it has done to propel gun ownership in the United States and gun violence in the United States, 
And, 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 but you don't do it because you're enraged. You say, well, Bob, I hear you, you're for the NRA. You know, I've been doing some reading. Uh, and so here's what I've learned about the NRA. And so I think that's a great way of combating the zealous quality of what we've seen um, in people. Because, you know, unfortunately, many, many people just have their, get their talking points, right, from the, from the media. And they're, they're pretty boring. Uh, a lot of people are pretty boring because they don't do any reading. They're just getting, you know, uh, in the context of the right, Hannity and, and, and Tucker Carlson and on the left, wherever they, wherever they go. But, you know, I, I've always felt that, you know, I don't get into shouting matches because I just bore people with facts. All right. I'm, saying, I'm saying class is over because I've had a long day. This was an absolute delight. When are we going to do it again? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. We will do it again. I want to thank um, you again. Great. Thanks I want to thank you, Professor Rupp, for doing this. I want to thank um, Steve Perkins. He is our leader of our Progressive Democrats of LaPorte County, and he really uh, gets us all moving along. And um, I um, want to give you a moment, Professor Rupp. I know you've got some upcoming um, events that sound really inter interesting. And so I want to give, uh, give you a moment to sure, tell, tell really us about really that, and then we'll close up. Real quickly, we launched a series today at Purdue Northwest called On the Other Side, PNW Examines the Post-COVID World. So it's a, it's a four uh, forum series. And we just wanted to um, bring our uh, uh, college uh, researchers and scholars together with community experts to examine topics. And because I think frankly, there's almost every aspect of the human experience is going to be changing. It's just that it's, this is that dramatic. Um, and so we, uh, we looked at leadership, how leadership is changing. That was one thing we did today. We're looking at cybersecurity uh, coming up. We're gonna look at social media uh, and we're going to look at uh, the industry of hospitality and tourism. Um, and, and again, we could do this for everything, K through how K through 12 is changing, how commercial real estate is mm -hmm. changing how healthcare is changing. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are using telehealth these days and I'm talking to my doctor and you know, the you know, there, there'll be so many positives coming out of COVID. You know, some of the costs of our life will, are going to go down and we're gonna be able to also do really cool things like this. Um, we, we've done a, a presentation on racism uh, at PNW and have, have over 300 people attend an event like this on wrongful convictions. That's wonderful. So that's what we're up to at PNW and we're very much looking forward to having students like Jack back in the classroom in the fall. That's great. Okay, and so um, if any of you here are not already members of the Progressive Democrats of LaFort County, well, I wanna invite you to join and go to our website, which is P-R-O-G-D-E-M-S-L-C.com, uh, right? Oh good, Dahlia's not in there. Okay, and you can join the group there and stay tuned to our Facebook page uh, where we will have uh, future events like this. So thanks again, everyone. And I will Hi, see everyone. you next time. Bye.